Hello and welcome to our webinar entitled The Real Estate Professional Status and we're going to talk a little bit about what it is, how it can help you and what you can take advantage of it with here. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Douglas Dow and I am the CIO of Eagles Flight Equity Group. We are in the business of uh, finding uh, opportunities in the real estate space. We really, really, really like build to rent right now and we like hard money loans. Um, but needless to say, we're here to share with you today something I think that flies a little under the radar and a lot of you could take advantage of if you just knew about it. So that's why we're here today to share this with you here. And so let's uh, dive right in. Um, even though I stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, I am not offering legal or tax advice. Please consult an LLM or CPA or EA uh, or your favorite shaman. Uh, before implementing this uh, tax strategy, you want to make sure um, somebody sits with you and decides this. Uh, this is just here to educate, and hopefully help you make it, you know, make an informed decision moving forward. All right. And so essentially, let's uh, talk about what is it? Uh, real estate uh, professional status is a designation granted by the IRS to uh, if you meet certain criteria, you can really do some really interesting things. And these qualifications include spending more than 50% of your work time on real estate um, and, and performing at least 750 hours of service. Now, we're going to get into what that means and how to make sure we do this. And so essentially, but before we're talking about the tips and tricks and traps, um, what are the benefits? Now, I think the key thing to note about the real estate professional status is this is off of ordinary income. Most investors, if you're working a job and you have some passive real estate over here, you can always deduct off that stuff. But if if you have um, a certain limit, then it, it, it certainly can become a limit and it's not as great as ordinary income. So it, it, that, that is the main benefit is it's twenty up to 25,000 off of your ordinary income. So you're basically, before you start Slicing and dicing, you take it kind of off the top there. So it's really an incredible opportunity. Um, the benefit also is you get to carry forward any losses as well. And you get to also apply those to future years if you can't, uh, if you take more than the 25K. So um, that's a beautiful thing there. Um, and then it also, you can also, it doesn't affect your passive limitations at all, also. Uh, so you can normally, um, participate in that way and and do what you're doing over there and and how that would go now the qualifications um these are really important and we have to be real careful how we document this and we'll get to that in a minute um you have to uh according to the documentation you have to uh, take take part in at least 10 separate real estate activities during the tax year um you must materially participate too that's a very important word Material participation, and that's one of the one of the definitions of what that means. Uh, there's a 50% test. You must spend more than 50% of your time. Uh, so if you are working, you know, 90 hours a week in a tech job, um, this probably isn't going to work for you. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then the 750 hour test. You must perform more than 750 hours of service to make that work. Um, now, how to blow it. Um, I think this is a really important case, and, and, and guys, if you get a chance, I really recommend uh, taking a look at this case because it really is like in a nutshell um, what, like how to make it work for you and then how you get caught if it doesn't work and so what it looks like. It's a really great uh, case study on how to make sure that this works for you. Um, and what the facts were, Dr. Bailey was a busy professional doing the doctor thing. And his spouse, and, and this is what I think was interesting too, I think this is a textbook case of where the real estate professional status can really be awesome is one spouse works in a really high income job and then the other spouse gets involved in real estate and really um, work, it's, it's teamwork makes the dream work. And this is a case where it really is awesome and you can and have some incredible, uh, incredible opportunities. Now, in this particular case, um, We'll get to it in just a minute. Uh, it did just create another interesting side side strategy too. You can do a little bit different things with short-term rental strategies. I, I did include a 
a blog article there for you in the uh, in the PDF here um, to take a look at that as well. It's a distinct opportunity from uh, real estate professional status. And so um, wanted to make sure and let you guys know we have that separate opportunity as well. If you wanted to do Airbnb, it's a different strategy completely and distinct from this. And they and they don't work together well necessarily. So you want to make sure and 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 look at that real careful. Um, and I did include the uh, link for the case. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, that is here in the in the paperwork. So if you want to uh, take a look at that case and on your own, I really recommend reading this if you're interested in executing this. All right. Um, the footnotes are always juicy in a case law. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, back in law school, I was fortunate enough to have a great tax professor, and in you know, I swear most of the really great juice was down on the down on the notes. And so this is uh, one of the great things to note about uh, real estate professional status. You've got to really log it. It's really critical if you're trying to meet the 750 hours, you've got to keep a great log. Uh, just really document, document, document. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, Google Calendar might be a perfect way of doing that too, right? If, as long as even if you have a Google calendar, you block out your time and it's really clear, hey, it's hard to argue that you went back and, oh, you backdated all that. Well, not likely. Uh, so it's a really great uh, defense if the IRS calls you on it. And I will say, too, um, I, I think this is not their favorite thing in the world. So if the IRS got uh, got a hold of you and they wanted to take a look, this is one thing that will get their attention, I think. Yeah, they don't think they particularly like this provision. Um, but I wanted to, to encourage you all to take a look at that and, and make sure and document, 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 document. Um, and in this particular case, it just shows how important the facts are. Um, and when they did all the adding up in the case, uh, she had 679 hours of operating on three rental properties and then, then they had an N. And so the, 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 the case turned on the fact that that she was materially participating in that, uh, that in and that wasn't considered as a passive in, in passive business. So that's really interesting here where he's like, oh, you can confuse yourself and say, well, I've got an Airbnb over here and I'm doing that and count that under 750. It doesn't look like that works either. So that's another important distinction when you're doing this. Airbnb it should be thought differently in different strategy. If you want to be a REPS, you might think in terms of passive, um, passive investments only. Um, and, and so that's Kind of interesting too it's like you got to material participate in a passive investment so it's a almost a contradiction in terms but we wanted to include that here um and uh, and so they ended up losing uh and uh they were disallowed the deduction of sixteen thousand dollars and so that really uh changed their tax outcome there all right and so um Overall, we just wanted to thank you guys for uh, for turning up and talking about that. And we now are open to questions about the real estate professional status. And if you guys want to talk about that, for sure, we can do that. I thought that I just heard recently that there was uh, some sort of allowance now that for people who were doing Airbnbs that they were still going to get the benefit. Yeah, it's actually a different, uh, it's a Schedule C type property where Schedule E is a rental property. So Schedule C is over there with your Airbnb. So that's why they do have a different strategy with that. I did include a link in the, uh, there's a great uh, tax uh, CPA firm and they had a great article about that I had to include and it is in the, in the documents here that I'll make sure and share with everybody. So you have the links and you can go back and research that and uh, see what that is. If that's a, a road you want to go down. Bye. Have none of those, but uh, I love to know everything, so I need to see it. Yeah, it's always helpful to, for people to know. Hey, if I if you know somebody in short term, it's like, hey, you know, you could do X, and it's it's uh, always a good uh, good thing to help them with it. Yeah. You could put a box under the bridge, claim it's an Airbnb rental, and there you go. Hmm, mm. there's, there's gonna be some strategy that can be utilized. <laughs> That's, That's right. Absolutely. So by definition, is an Airbnb the same as or different than a short-term rental? And I think the Airbnb is much more in the short-term rental space. So like a hotel, Airbnb, it's it's kind of the same thing. And it's more like a, 
it's more like a business, more less less real estate, more business when they, when you get into that. Uh, it gets to get really really fuzzy because I think they still take depreciation not a problem, but you still have the active nature of a hospitality business, and I think they they just look at it differently. And this is going to go ahead. Oh, so even if you're using a property manager. I, I think so. I think it's still considered more of a business, but again, I, that's a, a fuzzy, fuzzy case for me, and I'm not super sure uh, on that particular point, Mar Margaret. So I'll have to look in the research and double check that. But I still think, even though you might be using a property manager, it does, it, it's a it's a fuzzy problem because it's a hospitality business. But it's specifically got to be passive. Sorry. Yeah. For the tax yeah. credit. Yep, yep, and that's the main main point about uh, our EPS uh, status is it, it's it is a hundred percent your passive income uh, rental and rental properties for sure. I'm I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. So if I have say say for instance, Doug, you have a a short term rental, and you want to purchase this, you need maybe some investors, some LPs. If I invest with you as an LP, does that mean that I am now part of a short-term rental that I can use those that, that funds to deduct? Or do I need to own this directly and manage it to capitalize on that, that deduction? Because what I'm finding is not all states allow short-term rentals anymore. Some mm -hmm. are outlawing them. And so you really need to know if you if there is somebody that does have one, how does that work in your strategy? Yeah, I think when you start talking about an LP position in that case, I think that does more ring the bell in the passive side. But again, that's a great question. I, I'm not 100% sure of, but it sure feels like that's much more a different question. If you're an LP in an in a Airbnb property, I think that's more toward the other side. Yeah. But then again, you've got the material participation. And if you're an LP, then I think that defeats the, the material participation issue there. So I don't think that really, I think that's where you get into problems if you're a, an, a strictly LP and everything you're in, I don't think you can do the REPS. I can't imagine how. Yeah, I sure don't see how. If, and what, if they're like long-term rentals, now that's where it starts to, you know, what's material participation and then you start to get into like, well, if I have a property manager, I still think you can meet it by doing other things related. Um, but I think that's where it starts to get fuzzy too, is well, what counts as material participation. And, and I don't know the super de nuanced details. And again, that's where we want to make sure uh, we look at that real closely with your tax professional when you're, when you're really about to execute that. Hey, does that count? Yes, it looks like from the cases. And again, a lot of this, frankly, I think you can learn a lot just by reading the tax cases and saying, well, what does material mean? And you read like five of the real great tax cases and you can say, okay, that's really pretty solid. You can create a, a, a baseline of what that would look like. So Doug, I'm picturing that your evenings are sitting around thinking of pink elephants, reading <laughs> tax cases. There's not, a, I mean, I don't know how much more fun you can have other than drinking a, a bunch of NyQuil and then reading a tax code. Um, oh, I forgot about you can't the think NyQuil. Of better, uh, can't think of a better party than that myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, and Rose, it is great to see. I understand you guys are back in Korea right now. Arturo's probably still asleep. He made the earlier call today. Yeah, he sure oh, did. Hey there. Thank you for taking your time to share this great info. For sure. Rose, how are you doing? Good. Actually, Arturo is awake. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> poor soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah, great it's to fun. see you guys. Their, their, their meetup is great. We really have been enjoying their meetup. That's for sure. Uh, thank you for your kind words. <laughs> I did have a question though. Uh, so in multifamily syndication wise, as a GP, mm -hmm. uh, do we have to own certain percentage of GP, the ownership to claim, I mean. 
I, I don't uh, think so. I think uh, as long as you meet the uh, the fifty percent in the seven fifty hour rule, I don't think the percentage ownerships matter. Uh, I think as you meet those two rules, I think you're golden. And again, that's uh, one thing I'll double check and uh, I'll, get, I'll I'll follow up on that and make sure. But it sure looks like that would did not you know just even like two percent of the GP if you're materially at you know doing the GP side like uh you know performing uh, investor relations and and doing mm-hmm. those other active active roles i i can't see how that doesn't doesn't meet the t- doesn't check the box but for sure i'll double check that mm, thank you so yeah. if it helps people monitor time uh i've started using go high level as my crm and if i make calls out of that crm it can even record the calls which mm. Is why I'm not doing it because I'm afraid I'm going to be on a call with somebody in California. Forget to mention it, and it's recorded the call. Uh, but you you can imagine how, in terms of tracking every email, every text message, every phone call, uh, even a Zoom call, you can record the video. Uh, would all be recorded automatically. Um, with go high level, and I imagine the other CRMs are going to come around to doing that pretty quickly, mm-hmm. in which case such tracking is going to probably become a non-issue for all of us. I hope. Well, and wouldn't yeah, it matter well, where you're making the call from rather than who you're calling? Yeah, I have to be making a call from my Go High Level account, and then it will recognize it. If they phone in to my phone number, then it's captured. Uh, mm. which is why I'm still giving out my cell phone a lot just so people don't. Yeah, I I've just got, don't want to be recording calls rudely. <laughs> I've got a CRM that does that. And um, so like if they call the the number that's connected to it, which isn't my regular cell phone number, it, it'll, one, it records it and you got to, which is great for, you know, going, oh my gosh, you sound like an idiot. And you need to practice your scripts. <laughs> <laughs> My voice never sounds the same to me. Uh, and I apologize for how it must all sound to you because it sounds horrible to me. Uh, <laughs> I think you okay. can be a it's, professional it's broadcaster. Matter, yeah. It's not going to matter Margaret. in six months. AI is yeah. going to be making <laughs> calls for you. Yeah. So I've been spending a lot of time researching AI, and uh, it sounds like you might have as well, Margaret. And what I have come to determine, by the way, Douglas, when I saw that you would put LLM there, mm. as, uh, one, for me now, that means large language model. Right. That's a chat GPT. That's a Claude AI uh, bar. Well, I have a joke for Margaret. I think every LLM is a large language model anyway. We'll call it a joke, okay? That's <laughs> yeah, that's a that's he's, a really really inside joke. He he's probably referring to my brother Peter. Where is Peter? He's loquacious. <laughs> he is loquacious, but it, uh, I I love every single word, so I don't mind it at all. <laughs> well, I will say this as I continue exploring these AIs, and that is. Um, you know, first I was trying to determine which is the best for me to utilize. And I can't view it that way. Maybe someday you can, but at this point, mm-hmm. you almost have to view each one as if it's a separate employee because they do have their specialties. So chat GPT might be the best overall uh, large language model out there. But hey, when it comes to analysis, Claude AI has a huge advantage on it because you can upload the equivalent of, say, a, mm-hmm. a 500 page book into mm. Claude AI and say, mm-hmm. give me a summary. Whereas with chat GPT, you're doing a cut and paste that pretty much screen to screen, you're, you're very limited in what you can do. So you could attach a PDF, you could attach a whole spreadsheet, whatever uh, the case might be. And so when it comes to analysis, at this point, I'm looking at Claude AI. And other than that, uh, perplexity, if you need access to the internet, Chappy, chat GPT, boy, it's too late for me, Doug. I apologize. Mm. It's, um, you know, it's not timely. It's not up to the moment 
internet access. And perplexity does that. Perplexity is built on chat GPT. Uh, so it's just a, a little bit of a variance in the algorithm. Um, but yeah, it, it gives you YouTube videos and such. So, you know, depending on your use, it's just uh, amazing. I do have an image here you might all find of some interest here. If I can get it to chat, let's see. Like a there we go. Maybe I can find that image and just drag it over. Well, it, when I find it, you'll be amazed. <laughs> there we go. Just some of the AIs I'm trying to explore. Oh, wow. That's a lot more broad than I realized even. Wow. And and there's some that aren't on there that I'm also looking at that are quite interested, but uh, quite interesting. Well, uh, I will say it, it has it, it has really spiced up my uh, my LinkedIn game for sure because the what you can do with AI art um, just is incredible. When no, you would have normally had to outsource like that and had a really expensive designer do some of the artwork for your different stuff, it's like it really is a game changer on that. Love to see what Mid Journey might be able to do with pink elephants. <laughs> okay, draw me. Okay, Mid Journey, draw me a pink elephant uh, reading tax code. Yes. While drinking Nyquil. And it, and suddenly somehow you're in every image. 